just as a um, introduction to this week's parasha, uh, last week we spoke about the mishpatim, which are all the laws that God gave Moses to teach the Jewish people in order that they live as a civilized nation. With their, without any law and order, there is unfortunate chaos. Um, the previous parasha to that, Yitro, is when God stood at Mount Sinai, gave the Jewish people the Ten Commandments, and uh, followed by that was Mishpatim of last week's Torah portion. So we went from the Ten Commandments to the laws of a, a man between man, man and his fellow, and now we are studying the Parashav Truma, which is a spiritual aspect of our very own existence and primarily speaking about the fundraising and building and the dimensions and the plans for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle. Um, the Jewish people were instructed what to bring, how much to bring, and Moses, of all people, was the one who was tasked to make this appeal, a very strange appeal. If you take a look at your screen, I'm going to share with you. The beginning of this Torah portion, second verse, it's Exodus chapter 25, verse 2. It says, Daber el b'nei Israel. God tells Moses to speak to the people of Israel, v'ikhu li teruma, and they shall take for me a, an offering. Me'et kolish asheri divinu libo t'ikhu et terumati, from each and every person whose heart inspires them, generosity, they shall take my offering. This is the question of the week. It's always a question. Every year we take a look at this. This word v'ikhu literally means to take. And the obvious question is, was Moses asking everyone to take something or was he asking each and every person to give something? When someone asks for something, they say, can you give me it? They don't say, can you take it? Take it means I'm giving you something. Here, take my pen. Or if you're the one with the pen, I'll say, give me your pen. Or may I please have your pen? So there's a major, major issue with the take versus give uh, verb that's being used in the verse. Now, may there possibly be a message that God is conveying for Moses to give to the Jewish people. And this is a very famous story. It could be you've heard this story from me uh, from a couple years ago. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a funny, sad, true story all at once. So listen to the following. There were two good friends who went out fishing, Mark and Irving. They went on a long fish, their fishing trip. They uh, had been out for uh, nearly two hours and a tremendous storm came and flips the boat. Very scary. And they both fall over. So Mark being the stronger of the two, very strong swimmer, he's able to make it back on top of the boat. Irving was struggling to get on. And at that point, uh, Mark is calling to, to Irving and he is telling him, come on, come on. So he's trying to save him and he's like drowning. And he unfortunately drowns. So Mark and Irving went out on a boat. Mark is the only one who comes back after the very scary heart storm. So he gets back to shore and now he is about to uh, maybe face one of the most difficult moments in his life, Irving's wife. Irving and Mark's wives both come over and they only see one of the two. So Irving's wife asks Mark, Mark, what happened to my husband Irving? And unfortunately he said, well, <laughs> he didn't make it. He says, how does that mean he didn't make it? You made it, he didn't make it. Well, what does that mean? He said, what did you do to try to save his life? He said he called, he kept calling, calling out, give me your hand, give me your hand, give me your hand. So she said, you fool. You should have said, take my hand. My husband Irving, he never gave anything to anyone. Ron liked the joke. Okay, fine. It, it may be a funny one. You probably heard this from me years past. Uh, the message is very, very strong. 
you see, very often we make the same mistake as Irving. We hear the word give and we cringe. Can you give me something? People cringe, unfortunately. However, if we realize that by giving, what we are really doing is we're taking. Now, yes, you may think, oh, this is a sales pitch. Oh, you're not giving, you're taking, you're taking, you're giving. It, you're just, just a play on words. But no, in re all, all seriousness, putting all jokes aside, when a person attaches themselves to an opportunity and they become a partner for a worthy cause, in essence, they're taking. Yeah, they may be giving some of their time, some of their advice, their expertise, some money. But what they in essence are doing is they are taking an opportunity. It's just like when you buy something. When you buy something, you're giving something and you're getting something. You're giving something and you're saying, whatever this is, whatever this value is, I prefer to give that in order to take something else. And that is the exact same thing when it comes to giving to others, giving towards schools, organizations. What we are doing is we are giving something, but in essence, we're really taking. We're taking an opportunity. We're taking the merit, the eternal merit that lies within whatever cause we are actually supporting and helping. Let me add in one more concept. The, our sages tell us, I'll say it in Hebrew, Harbe sheluchim lamakom. There's a lot of messengers to God. God has many mes messengers. That means if God has it set out in his divine plan that a certain school, a certain organization, a certain institution, a certain charity is going to be able to provide, whether it's services, food, education, whatever it is to others, that organization is going to have the resources it needs in order to make it happen. The question is, who which of the individuals are going to be the ones that take the merit, that actually take part in having that mitzvah, that good deed, that mission, that godly mission actually take place? Now, of course, there is a limit. Maybe there could not be a limit, right? The more resources, the more one can do. But those who help in the infancy of any type of charity or organization are trying to help or bring good to one's community, one, one's country, the world, the Jewish people as a whole, the harder it is for the organization and you come to alleviate them. Or, same, the harder it is for one to give or one to do, they're actually taking part in more merit in whatever it is they set themselves out to do. This is a very important concept. There's a concept which many don't speak about, or you, you have different types. You have some people that always speak about these concepts, and it's always it always turns to a fundraising pitch. And you have others, let's say like us, that we, we don't always speak about the same concept. We don't always speak about this concept. And this concept is very apropos to this week's Torah portion, being that this is when Moses got up and he made an appeal to raise money for the tabernacle, for the Mishkan, which then he didn't know how long they would use it for. We know now, post facto, that they used it for 40 years. But they didn't know exactly how long or what it was going to be uh, used for exactly. Yet this was the first, and I dare to say the last time in history, that the one, the individual who was making the appeal, had to come out and say, stop. Normally, if there's a goal, a campaign goal, 100,000, a million, 10 million, whatever the number is, if they ever reach the goal, they don't close down the, the campaign and say, okay, we're done. No, let's make another, let's do another 10%, another 20%. Because the truth is, is every organization can really use more resources to do even greater things. But when it came to Moses raising funds for the tabernacle, there was a specific amount that was needed to be used that God commanded him to raise. And as soon as they raised that amount, he told everyone to stop bringing their gold, their silver, their jewels. It was enough to the point where the Jewish people were so enthusiastic and coming and donating to, towards this. It happened very, very quickly. In less than three days, they raised, I mean, an equivalent to today, millions, if not billions of dollars worth of, of, of gold and silver and resources. 
And the Jewish people came in a very, very speedy and quick way because they wanted to take part. Can you imagine that you are taking part in such a project, in a project that is going to be the home for God? And that is, in truth, how we are to look at every opportunity of, of, of charity and change our outlook from me giving and me being it a burden to us actually taking, taking part in a greater cause, taking part in an opportunity that whether we like it or not, if it was, if it is the will of God, it's going to take place anyways, just who's going to be the ones who's going to jump up to take that merit. So that's one short introduction I want to give to this week's Torah portion. And I have one more. This is a very, very close, very, very, uh, years ago when I read this, it really hit home to me, and, and I want to share this concept with you. While going through the details of all of the pieces, all of the utensils that were built and constructed in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, there are three utensils which stand out. Of course, each one had its own specific dimensions and details in its own right, but there are three utensils which stand out from the rest because they were the only ones which were fabricated with a golden crown surrounding it. Out of all of the utensils that were made, only these three had a golden crown. One of them is the ark, where the tablets laid, the table, the shulchan, where the showcase bread was, and the altar. These three were the only ones that had a, again, let me repeat that, that's the ark, the table, and the altar. The Talmud in Masechet Yomah, page 72b, tells us that these three utensils having crowns correspond to the three crowns that God gave the Jewish people. The crown of Torah, that's the ark. The crown of the table, that is kingship. And the crown of priesthood, which is alluded to in the altar, by the altar. Makes sense, right? Three and three. Three had a crown for the three crowns that God gave to the Jewish people. Now, Aaron merited the crown of priesthood. David merited the crown of kingship, only David and his descendants. And the crown of Torah was there, and the Talmud says, available for all to take part of, for all to take merit. Only the Torah. So priesthood is one, only for Kohanim. Kingship is only for direct descendants of King David. But Torah is for all. The Kliakar, one of the foremost commentaries on our Torah, and Acharon, a medieval scholar, not a medieval, sorry, a, a more recent scholar uh, from around 200 years ago. The Kliakar asks a question. He says, it's ironic to notice the distinction between the dimensions of these three items. So they all have a commonality. The commonality between them is they're all utensils used in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, and they all have a golden crown. And they're the only ones that have a golden crown. But when it comes to their dimensions, there is a distinct difference between the three. And it happens to be in their measurements. Measurement number one for the Ark. All of the ark's measurements were in half measurements. The Torah says it should be two and a half cubits by one and a half by one and a half, all in cubits. Those are all broken. Those are all half dimensions, half measurements. The table, the table has part and part. It's two by one by one and a half cubits. And the altar is complete measurements. It's five by five by three cubits. So you have the ark, they're all broken measurements, half measurements. The table, there's some that are full, some that are broken. And the altar are all, all complete whole numbers. The Kliakar says, could there be a reason for this distinction? They already have something in common. Why should they be different when it comes to their measurements, their dimensions? Of course, the size must be different, but why... Is there this difference between all broken, part broken, and fully and, and, and all full and wholesome numbers? Listen to a beautiful concept. This is a message that 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 really, really hits home very strong. What does the ark represent? The ark that had the tablets it represents the Torah, it represents wisdom. A person 
has to always feel that they are lacking in wisdom, lacking in Torah. It's so important for the following two reasons. Number one, a person should always have the aspiration to learn more, to further their education, to deepen their wisdom. And secondly, if a person thinks they know it all, they're not able to accept from anyone else. The greatest scholars, the greatest Torah scholars, do you know how they are called, how they are referred to? As a Talmid Chacham, a student of wisdom. The greatest rabbis. Nowadays, many will say that Rabbi, well, let's not give any names. Greatest of the leaders. The greatest of the leaders, whether it be here in America or in Israel, they know our Torah off by heart. They know the Talmud off by heart. They know volumes and volumes off by heart. And not only off by heart, but they're able to, to answer complex questions and formulate tremendous, tremendous novelties. You know how we refer to them? As Talmidei Chachamim, students of wisdom. Because when a person looks at themselves as a student, looks at themselves as still lacking in Torah and wisdom, they will continue to pursue that wisdom. That's number one. Number two, the so that's why all the measurements by the Ark are half measurements. Next, when it comes to the table, the table has some that are whole, some that are half. The table is something that alludes to materialism, right? The table had the showcase spread on it. Parnasa, livelihood, materialism. And in one way, we have to have two aspects, both aspects, one of being satisfied and one of being lacking. On one hand, a person has to be full and content with what they have. As we've learned, who's a wealthy person, one who's happy with what they have. But on the other hand, a person also has to not fully indulge in what they have. A, an aspect of abstaining somewhat. It doesn't mean if you have $100 in your pocket, you go to a restaurant and you spend all $100 on eating. Again, that's a, a, a futile example, but it doesn't mean that a person should live according to their means. The Torah really is telling us you are supposed to live below your means. Now, very interesting to note, the Western civilization that we live in, and it's practically um, practically spread throughout the world in this day and age, is always pushing us as consumers to live above our means. Let's face it. All, if not most of us, um, would not be able to afford the house we either currently live in or originally bought. There's a concept of a mortgage. There's a concept of, of living in something which right now you can't afford, but over the next 30 years of payments, you could afford to live in the house you live in. And the same idea is with leasing. Many people are not, afford, are not able to afford the car they lease, but because leasing, leasing allows you to indulge in something that you may not be able to afford again, living above your means. Now, is that right? Is it wrong? What should a person actually do? That's it on a personal basis, one to one. However, the concept is, the concept should be that a person should on one hand be very happy, very fulfilled with what they have, but on the other hand, in a half measure, live below their means. That doesn't mean to say that a person should rent their entire life. No, of course, the world we live in and the economy that we live in, taking a mortgage out to buy a house is definitely the right move. But it's just something to contemplate, to see that the way that, that economics and, and the civilization, the society that we live in today is completely the opposite of this concept. That's the second. Number three, the altar. The altar was only in complete measurements. Again, five by five by three cubits. The altar alludes to repentance and atonement. What was the altar there for? The altar was there to bring sacrifices on, and that connected God 
really the Jewish people back to God when God provided that forgiveness and that atonement. And we have to come wholeheartedly to God with complete measurements, with, with belief and trust that Hashem accepts and forgives. That is why the Kliakar says the measurements for the altar were in complete numbers. So again, the Ark Wisdom, we sort of feel lacking when it comes to Torah and wisdom, that we continue and push ourselves to learn more and open to learning from others. The table, it's some and some, because on one end we have to be happy with what we have, on the other hand we should not overindulge or indulge in everything. But the altar has complete measurements as a sign of our true faith and belief in God that he accepts and fully accepts and forgives us when we come wholeheartedly to him. So with that introduction, I want to jump into the Zer Shimshon's insight for this evening. And this specific topic speaks about the uh, construction of, or the, really the casting, the preparation of the menorah. In the, in the tabernacle, the menorah that was made was made out of one solid piece of gold. Okay. Besides for its tremendous fortune, it was also a, a, a truly artistic masterpiece, definitely one of a kind. And the Torah tells us, take a look at your screen. The Torah tells us, this is in Exodus chapter 25, verse 3. You shall make it its lamps seven, meaning there should be seven branches to this menorah. Unlike our Chanukia, our Chanukia actually has nine branches. It has the eight days of Chanukah plus the Shamash. The menorah in the time of the tabernacle, so as well as in the temple, had seven branches. And we'll explain that why in a moment. Al ever panea, and it shall kindle its lamps, and he shall kindle his lamps. Speaking about Aaron, when he would light the lamps, so that they should lead, uh, that they should shed light towards its face. Another great difference between the menorah, we're going to refer to the menorah as the one in the in the in the tabernacle and the Chanukiah, what we use on Chanukah, is that there was no distinction, no difference in height between or position between all seven of them. They all lined up directly. By us, whether it's on the side or in the middle, the shamash is elevated. So those are the two main differences between a menorah and a chanukiah. The number of branches, whether it's seven or nine, and as well as a difference to the shamash or no difference to the shamash. The one in the mishkan had absolutely no difference. Now, a flame is compared to the soul. This is something we've all heard about before, that when a person passes on, Unfortunately, their body loses the soul that occupied it, and that person passes on, and it's unfortunately like a, a flame that is being extinguished. Based on this, the if we look at a flame, the there is a base and then there is a top. And the way gravity works, and there's a reason for this, besides for, for just generally in gravity and, and combustion, but the base always stays at the bottom and the top of the flame always goes upwards. And the reason for this is because there's, there's actually a reason for this. Zereshim Shon tells us about this, that it's always pointing up. A flame is always pointing up, which resembles our souls, which are always connected to a greater source. It's always connected to up above. When we're alive, sometimes people have a spirit of inspiration and they don't sometimes understand where that comes from. It's because their soul is actually connected above to something greater than them. And when the person is alive, that's what happens. And when the person passes away, unfortunately their soul goes right back up. She says a flame is always facing up. And that is one of the reasons why we do light candles. We do light a flame in memory for our loved ones, for our great sages who've passed away. And just as a quick note on that, before we continue the Zer Shimshan, is that whenever we light in memory of someone, we are not praying to them. Early on, within the first year of a person's passing, we are praying for them, for them to have a um, favorable judgment. 
But after that, we are praying to God in their merit. It's very different. We don't pray to the deceased. We never pray to the deceased. We pray to God in the merit of the deceased, whether it may be our parents, grandparents, our sages, our patriarchs, matriarchs, whoever it may be. We are not praying to them. We are praying to God in their merit. Okay. Having said that, the Zer Shimshon says that as Jews, we need to illuminate our neshamot, our souls, which resembles a flame. We need to ignite them. We need to turn, light them up, turn them on fire. How? Through fulfilling Torah and mitzvot, through learning Torah, through doing good deeds, making the right decisions. But how do we ignite? How do we light the flame? Says Azar Shimshan, a tremendous concept. And this concept fits perfect with this month, with this time of the year. And that is through doing, through learning, through fulfilling with joy and happiness, says the Zer Shimshan. When a person does something with joy and happiness, everything changes. You're doing the exact same thing, but you feel upbeat, positive, inspired about it, or do you have a frown on? What do we have to be happy for? Asks the Zer Shimshon. So he answers through a midrash based on the following verse. The verse is in Kohelet. King Solomon writes in Kohelet chapter 6 verse 7, Kol amal ha'adam lepihu. All of a person's toil is for his mouth. Vigam ha'nefesh lo timale. And is the appetite not yet sated? Now, having said that, based on that verse, explains the Zer Shimshon, based on the Midrash, that all the good a person does, a person, meaning everything Hashem asks us to do, all of the mitzvot, all the Torah study, all the right decisions, even if a person does and does and does, it still does not even scratch the surface or come an inkling of amount of enough for how much we owe to God for even one breath this makes a lot of sense nowadays. Unfortunately, most of us, if not all of us, have known people who've either had certain COVID complications with breathing or even passed on, unfortunately, through COVID. And as we know that this, this vicious virus attacks the respiratory system to many. And we, many of us, unfortunately, at times, I, want, I don't want to say always because right now we don't, but at times we take the very fact of breathing for granted. Let's all take a deep breath all together. I know this is not a yoga session, but to express our, our true thanks and, and gratitude to God. Uh, do we ever, do we once a day take a deep breath, let the oxygen fill our lungs and thank God for it? If we don't, maybe we should. At a minimum of once a day, the Midrash says that no matter what a person does, it doesn't even scratch the surface of the gift that God gives us to breathe one breath. Meaning, God's given us so much more, says Ezer Shimshon, than just one breath. Every one of us has reasons upon reasons to be happy and thankful for. And no excuse to be depressed. Unfortunately, today I spoke with an individual. I definitely will not tell you his name. And he told me that he is trapped in a very deep, deep depression. He feels like he's at the bottom of a well. There's no rope and there's no ladder and there's no way out. And he's working on his way out, but he, it's, it's, it's impossible, he says. He says it's almost impossible. And what you say to a person who's depressed, it's very hard. It's not easy. Sometimes they may be some, some other uh, issues and, and imbalance that maybe need certain medication, herbs or whatever route a person chooses. But philosophically, let's say it that way, one of the greatest ways to get out, to break out of depression, besides for in in indulging and engaging in physical activity, which is tremendously important, especially 
working out, whether it be walking, running, jogging, weightlifting, sports, obviously that is one of the, the, the great methods of, of cutting out of depression. But also philosophically and intellectually analyzing your life and counting all the blessings we do have and all the reasons we have to be happy for. The human mind, unfortunately, this is the way God created us in order for us to work on it and to overcome it, very often focuses towards negativity. We've spoken about this before. The Gaon, the Gaon Mivilna, the Gra, tells us that a person's brain is like a, uh, a field, so to say. Not, not a huge field, but a field. If you plant the field, then fruits will come. If you don't, all that will grow is weeds, which are detrimental. The mind is the same way. When the mind is preoccupied with focusing on good and things to be happy about, that's what it focuses on, and that's what it grows. But when a person is not focusing and making an intention and a, a, an effort on focusing on positivity and on happiness and on things they have to be happy for, then unfortunately the mind gravitates towards what they're not happy about, what they're depressed about, what they're, what they're negative about. It's a very, very slippery slope. It's very dangerous. So anyone at times when things go bad, when things are hard, when things are not working their way, when there are reasons, there are valid reasons a person can be sad and angry and depressed and, and, and wanting to give up. But it's during those times where God is testing us to see if we can overcome that by focusing on the good and focusing on what we have to be happy for what we have to be happy about. You know, some people consider it the, the end of the world when they get into a car accident, God forbid. And they're not hurt. They're fully healthy. The car is totaled. They have a deductible on their insurance now. They have to be stuck without a car for some time. They have to go through a major inconvenience. But how much are you left with? 10 fingers, 10 toes, all of your senses, your brain, your vision. So many things to be happy about. Why wait till everything, not everything, I'll take it back. Why wait till one thing is belly up, one thing is upside down to have to focus on the good? Start focusing on the good and on the positivity before things get hard and rough. And this is the lesson the Zer Shimshon is teaching us. The Zashim Shon is teaching us we have so many reasons to be sad about. But when you focus on something that to be happy about, that promotes even more happiness. And that's how God wants us to ignite our flame. How are we going to ignite our soul? Is through doing with joy and happiness. When we learn Torah, we're supposed to do it in a way that we're happy. We should never be forced to learn. It's very hard when it comes to children and teenagers. Sometimes we try to force things upon our children. And there's a very, very hard balance to strike on pushing in a positive way and not pushing too much like you're forcing. Everyone should try to learn a topic or topics in Torah that they enjoy, that they love. Some people love learning Jewish law. Others, it's Jewish philosophy. Others, it's the Torah portion. Talmud, Midrash, Zohar, mysticism, simple things. There are tons, stories, legends. There are tons and tons of topics. What we have to do, and by the way, in our lifetime, the topic of interest may change. Today, we may like a certain topic more than others, and later on, we'll, we'll like something else. Yes, we have an obligation to learn the entire Torah and everything there has. It's a plethora. But in the meantime, we might as well learn things that we enjoy, that we become inspired from. And that's what we try to offer here on a weekly basis and even on a daily basis. We always are trying to spread messages which make sense which challenge our way of thinking, which inspire us to do well. The Zer Shimshon is telling us when we learn, when we fulfill, when you put on your tefillin, when you wrap it on your arm, when you light your Shabbat candles, do it with a smile. Do it because you want to do it. If you don't want to do it, should you not do it? 
at the end of the day, we say you should still do it. Really, you shouldn't, but we do. Because we're supposed to do even if we don't understand. And even if we're not in the mood. But the greatest and the goal is, is to always be in the mood. It's to be happy. It's to be appreciative. It's to be joyous for the opportunity to fulfill, the opportunity to learn. Such a blessing. The Zer Shimshon tells us, the verse in, where's the verse? Tehilim. Tehilim tells us, Yemei, I, I didn't bring it up, so sorry, I'm not going to search for it in the meantime. The, the, the verse tells us, Yemei shenotenu bahem shiv'im shana. That a person's life, this is in Psalms, Tehilim, chapter 90, verse 10. That a person's life should be 70 years. And if a person is very, very powerful and strong, they could live 80 years. Shimonim shana. Says the Zer Shimshan, do you know why God told Moses to command for the menorah to have seven branches? It's to illuminate every single decade of a person's life. And since 70 for a long time was the goal, an entire person's life should be illuminated with the flames. And that's why there's seven branches. The Zer Shimshan tells us, we are to illuminate our lives and not allow darkness to creep in and impurify. It's light that sheds away darkness. It's the light of the menorah. You see the connection? It's the light of the menorah that is able to shed happiness on dark and sad times. And let's face it. This year, we are about to enter the 12th month of this pandemic. Literally in two weeks from now. At least to what we knew about. right? We're not going to get all political and know when did we knew when did it come out when did it happen who did it, who was the first one at the end of the day in the places that we all live in right after Purim everything shut down I consider shut down when my kids were told they can, 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 cannot come back to school anymore that was a crisis for us as, as it was to anyone who has small children at home and anyone who was not able to go to work that's a major crisis also we are now entering the 12th month of this period of darkness. But God doesn't want us to look at it as a darkness. He wants us to illuminate this time. To make this time worth it. To spend this time shedding light and happiness on all of these sad and very hard times. There's plenty to be sad about. There's plenty to, to complain about, to be doubtful about. And as we said, the brain will automatically gravitate towards that. That is not what God wants from us. God wants us to open more books, to attend more classes, to further our education, to do good deeds, to help others, to be there for others, to learn how to deal with your loved ones, to learn how to deal with your family members. If it's with your spouse that you're spending all day now with and your children, learn how to really face the people you live with and grow with them. That's the difference between shedding light and allowing darkness to creep in. So the lesson is with these flames of the menorah is do it besimcha, do it with joy, with happiness. Everything you do, whether it's between you and God, ben Adam or between you and your fellow, ben Adam l'chavero, do it all with joy and happiness. And before I finish this segment, I just want to repeat something which I spoke about last year, which I sent out in, in the video, the recording of last year. I don't know if you heard it or not, but the whole idea of Mishenichnas Adar, Marbim Besimcha, when we come into the month of Adar, we should add towards, add, add in happiness and joy. If you didn't listen to that class yet, I really, really suggest you to. It, it was a class that I gave last year at the Edmund J. Safra Synagogue in Aventura. It was a women's class. It was broadcasted live and you have the recording online. You have it on your WhatsApp. 
It's all over the place. Make sure to listen to it because right now is the time that it pertains to. And I just want to share the main point. We just gave tips on how to, how to become happy and to stay happy and to focus on happiness and the positivity 100%. We quoted from a Yalkut Avraham. This is a rabbi that lived around 100 years ago. He says, there's a segula, there's a good luck charm. And I go into great depth into the class. I'm not going to do it now, but you have it. Watch it. To great depth, how this works psychologically, not only mystically, psychologically as well. We have a great segula to write, make a poster, put it up by the entrance of your house, of Mishenichnas Adar Marbim Besimcha, when the month of Adar comes in, when we come into the month of Adar, we should add joy, Mazal Adar Dagim, that the good fortune of the month of Adar is fish. I want to share with you, just in case if you haven't seen, and I want to share a personal uh, testimony to how powerful this Sigula is. When I heard the Sigula, the rabbi that mentioned it said that he's seen with his own eyes major, major miracles. And of course we believe them, but it's not the same like when it happens to you, okay? Take a look at this poster. Can you see it well? Can you read it? Or, is, or does it flip it for you? Can you read it? Yeah? I made this last year with my children, okay? This, this, this is a very meaningful poster to me and I'll explain why. We put this exact piece up by our front door. And within, I'd say days of me coming in and my family coming in and out, again, during a very hard time, the beginning of the month of Adar was a great, the first two weeks was absolutely amazing. From the middle of the month, everything plummeted. That's when, that's when the pandemic started coming in day in, day out, looking at this, gave me a sense of inspiration, a reminder of if you act happy, if you are happy, if you feel happy, you will attract happiness and good things in your life. I want to say within days, maybe even weeks of this going up, Hashem put a, a plan in my mind and he gave me the, I guess, the courage to act upon it. And I'll say this sh story short. Many of you have heard this from me firsthand because it, whenever a, a miracle happens to you, whenever something good happens to you, you have an obligation to share it. But I'll share it very, very quick. Around the corner from where I live, there is a plot of land. It was 10 acres large. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you very quick. Many of you have heard this from me, so I don't want to bore you. But to those who haven't heard, I think it's, it's a, mit, a mitzvah to, to share. There's a plot of land that is 10 acres large. And it came to me that as, as my dear friends, many of you on this, on this call, on this, on this class, specifically Ron and Eileen, Always telling me, Rabbi Laredo, you have to stay in Hollywood. Hollywood is your place. Hollywood is your place. Hollywood is your place. And I go over to this. I, I say to myself, we have to do something big in Hollywood to spread Torah in a way like no other. Something that is available in person, online, all ages. It sounds too good to be true. As Yehuda also knows, so I set my, my eye on this, on, this, uh, on this land, and I go, literally, this is in the middle of the month of Adar, moments before Shabbat one Friday. I had an electric scooter lying around. It's another story. I get on the electric scooter. I'm already dressed for Shabbat. And I'll give you a tip, and I'm sure everyone has their own experience when it comes to succeeding in anything. But the power of the mind and the power of the eyes are extremely powerful. We've learned before that the power of the eyes can be completely detrimental, ayin hara, but the power of the eyes also have tremendous force and potential in, in acquiring things and in, 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 in setting goals and, and succeeding in those goals. So I get on this scooter and I say, I'm going to drive, do a drive-by. Gonna do a drive-by. 
I'm going to set my eyes on what I think is going to be the next home of our Torah center. So it's a, it's a shot in the ocean. By the way, normally a story within a story confuses, but I'll tell you quickly. When we moved to Florida, I used to drive up and down the street that I live on now for six months, almost once a day. You may call me, uh, uh, what's the word? Obsessive, lunatic, compulsive, whatever you want to say. I used to drive up the street that I live on every single, almost every single day, let's say five times a week for six months. And I was just, and I went down and I went as a prayer. Hashem, this is where I need to live. Why? It was situated exactly where I needed to for that time in life, for what I was doing at that time, as we all know. One street away from where I needed to be. And still one street away from where I'm going to be. So I went and I did a drive-by by this land. Lo and behold, the car, a car was in the driveway, which I've never seen before. This is around the corner for me. I drive by it almost every day. I knock on the guy on the door. I take a deep breath and someone answers the door. This guy opens the door. He's got nice long hair. Looks like a prestigious guy. Doesn't look like he's living in this shack. To make a long story short, I tell him, do you own this land? He says, well, I do. I said, I want to buy this land. He says, well, it's not for sale. Well, that made me want it even more. We schmoozed for half an hour, jumped back on my scooter. We ended off by exchanging numbers, very pleasant conversation. Jump back on my scooter, get home, ready for Shabbat, and I put my prayers in. A nine, I'd say a nine month development of back and forth, and some of you are, are even privy to, to some of what happened. Nine months back and forth discussing with this individual. Yes, sell, no sell, this price, that price, yes, no, other people interested, other people interested, no, yes, interested. So many back and forths to make a long story short. With the grace of God, we figured out a way, and it's more complex. We figured out a way to close on the land, to acquire the land, and a part of that land will be the next home, the future home of our Torah center, please God. And that is with a lot of efforts and prayers from us all. Now, you're going to think I'm crazy. You're going to think I'm lunatic. But look at this. Tell me this doesn't work. Just tell me this doesn't work. So it doesn't work because it's heebie-jeebie. It works because whatever you believe works will work. It's the law of attraction. We speak about this all the time. If you have this reminder up all month long, that this is a month that has a sigula, it has a good luck charm to be happy and to draw extra happiness and positivity. It will happen. So I'm marking literally a one year anniversary of putting this up and, and having a, a personal, it's not a personal miracle, it's a miracle for the entire community. It's a miracle to be perfectly located and situated in order for everyone to partake in such a cause. Again, take, not give. To take, to partake in such a cause that's going to help us keep on spreading Torah in a, a magnificent, powerful, inspiring way. And it's thanks to every one of you who come and learn, who support our learning, who come, whether it's in person or over the past month, bunch of months online, and hopefully to get back in, 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 uh, in, in the spirit of in-person learning in the good safety, Bizrat Hashem, very soon. Amen v'amen. So my message to all of you is do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Make a poster. Put it up. We're only one week into the month. Put the poster up by your front door. I think we did it last year. Take a picture of your poster and share it with me. Let's share it all together. And hopefully we will all see miracles and great joy and happiness because if that's what we are looking for, that's what will happen. If you're looking to grow your business, if you're looking to get married, if you're looking to build a family, to have children, 
if you're looking to add to your wisdom, if you're looking to becoming a better human being, if you're putting efforts into that, it will happen. You just have to want to do it. So go out and do it. Amen, amen.